All right, good morning. As we are talking in class about the foundations of writing and reading and where that information comes from, one of the things I want to make sure we have time to discuss is Aristotle to you. Um, the kind of the importance of Aristotle, Socrates, Plato, Alexander, the kind of the importance of the ancient Greek philosophers and how that still shadows over modern writing. It has been 2000 years, but there's a few pieces of information that we still use from these scholars. So I wanna make sure that it's very clear, even though the textbook does not spend much to any time on it. So in your um, Greek philosophy background, you may already know most of this information. If so, this is a review to make sure you're oriented to class. You may or may not have had a very good Greek background. Um, Greek philosophy is not required as readily as it once was. So looking at the screen, I want to kind of go over a few basic Greek philosophers. The acronym SPA is important, S-P-A-A -A in your notes. And that's going to stand for Socrates, which is the first philosopher we'll look at. And then we'll talk about Plato. And then we'll talk about um, Aristotle and move into Alexander. That's the family tree and kind of lineage that we're going to be talking about today. Um, one of the things I want to talk about is that Socrates, of course, is a philosopher, which means he's a professional thinker. His job is not necessarily to think, but that is one of the things that he does. Um, Socrates, besides being a philosopher, is also a teacher. And that is where he really becomes notable is in the fact that he is a teacher. Um, so as a professional thinker, he could not make money that way. As a teacher, students were bringing him wine, uh, food, money, resources. So Socrates could um, then have his career as a teacher. Teaching did look different. We call this the Socratic method. When we it, um, use this teaching style nowadays. But the Socratic method was not... Um, limited by classes or schedules or degree tracks the way college and high schools are currently tracked now. The Socratic method was a very loose um, organization. So if you wanted to learn, you would go and find the teacher, in this case, Socrates, and you would probably bring friends with you, you'd bring gifts with you, and you would ask Socrates a question. Your question could be something like, is the government corrupt? Socrates would never give you a straight answer. He would never give you a fact. He would never give you um, anything definite. What Socrates would give you was a question in return. So if you said, is the government corrupt? Socrates might counter with, why do you think the government is corrupt? This is why it's good to bring friends with you. You could talk amongst yourselves. And then you could um, say that the government does not meet the needs of the people. He would then ask, well, why do you think the government's not meeting the needs of the people? How do you think the government could meet the needs of the people? And lead you down that train of thought without actually telling you where you were going. It was a very inquisition-based learning. It's important that he never told anybody what to think, never gave them straight answers, only allowed them to think. The Socratic method is sometimes still used today in various um, degrees. One of the things is also important about Socrates, one of the greatest thinkers in the world that is still heralded and kind of this pillar of Western philosophy. One of the things that's really important about Socrates is that he's illiterate. Illiterate, of course, means that he lacks the skills to read and write. Now, in that generation, that is not uncommon. Um, Socrates in this Greek generation was living in an oral society in an oral generation. Writing had been tried a few times, but it just did not work. Um, and they had no written language. It was an all oral society. Still do exist sometimes. Um, what is important about the illiteracy of Socrates is that writing was actually perfected. Greek writing was perfected during his lifetime. And so what had happened before then was only the consonants had been written down, which means that you had to know what was written down, what hard sounds were written down to figure out what the word was. Um, what happens during Socrates' lifetime is that the vowels are written down, those soft sounds are written down, and then we could figure out what those soft sounds are and actually look at 
what the word is based on what the vowels are doing, which made a much more functional language than the Greeks have tried before. So the Greek language is perfected as a written language during his lifetime. That's so the one thing that the Greeks do that no other culture does. And it's one thing that the Greeks do is writing down the consonants and the vowels, the hard and soft sounds in that manner is unique to the Greeks. It's the one thing they do uniquely and give to the world is the vowel um, being written down. And in fact, it's perfected during his lifetime um, when Socrates is already an older man. He's already a teacher. He's already a respected philosopher. He's already a bit of a troublemaker because he allows people to think. And he famously says that writing, while it was perfected, he also felt that writing was evil and that writing should be destroyed. Okay. Um, which could just be a grumpy old man in an oral society. Um, he does provide some reasons eventually that in an oral society, um, if you do not remember it, if it is not recited, then it does not really exist. You know, forgotten history is irrelevant history. Um, so you constantly engage with your history, your religion, your politics, because you have to constantly be engaged with it, constantly keep it in the oral um, diaspora. And Socrates is very concerned, apparently, that if you wrote something down, you could forget about it. And so he thought it was evil. Uh, there, Socrates had lots of students. Chief among those is Plato. Okay. So Plato was the, probably the most notable student of Socrates. He, again, is a philosopher. He is a thinker that doesn't pay the bills. So he's a teacher uh, using the Socratic method that he learned uh, from Socrates and Socrates' contemporaries. And he is literate. He's a younger man than Socrates because he's a student. Um, perfected writing seems cool to him, but he's literate at a time, you know, literate just meaning having the skills to read and write. But he's literate at a time when only a small portion of the population in Greece has bothered to learn to read and write. It's, kind of, it's a party trick, basically. He believes it has a value. He believes it has a power. Um, he sees the power in the writing. He sees that writing can defeat space and that it can defeat time. And he understands that writing, thing down, writing something down makes it remembered, whereas Socrates is pretty sure if he wrote something down, it'd be forgotten. And so there's still largely an oral society that he's living in, but a small group of people have already figured out how to read and write. The most famous student of Plato is Aristotle. Aristotle is also a philosopher. He is also a teacher, right? He is also literate. By the time that Aristotle becomes literate, it is common of all educated people. Educated people meaning citizens of Greece, meaning white males of Greece, landowning white males of Greece. There's a lot of a caveat there to that statement. Um, but the core idea is that everyone that considers themselves educated has to know how to read and write by the time of Aristotle, which is a span of less than three generations. We go from a happily illiterate society to a happily embraced literature society very quickly. We go from writing being seen as evil to writing being seen as a um, large part of the society. It is still an oral society in many ways, but writing plays a large role. Um, for Socrates and Plato, if you wanted to make a change in Greek society, you had to stand in front of the, um, the senators, make a speech, and have them vote your way. You had to have those or oratory skills. Public speaking was your chief skill set. By the time of Aristotle, it, you could start a letter writing campaign, start um, sending notes from house to house, um, and make sure you had the support before you ever went up on stage and gave your speech. And so you effectively knew if you were going to get the votes or not before you ever delivered the speech because you'd use writing in secret. Um, and the writing had a secret kind of power to it, which was important. Um, so the oral society now being changed by the written power of writing. 
Aristotle's most famous student is Alexander. And in fact, Alexander, we regard and joke, is the greatest student of Aristotle um, because he's went down in history as Aristotle or Alexander the Great. So he's the, the great. He studied um, along the other men. He did not become a teacher. Um, he breaks that pattern. And what he winds up doing is becoming a soldier, a leader, and then the ruler of the entire known world. Um, Alexander's a young man, studied under Aristotle. He then goes into Northern Africa, conquers it, uh, Northern Egypt, conquers it, builds a bigger army, rolls back into Greece, conquers all of Greece, builds a bigger army, and starts conquering the world and gets over to the um, the Chinese empire and declares that the edge of the world and has a um, kingdom so big that it could not be ridden across twice on horseback. So that is important because the Greece that we talk about of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle are really warring factions. They're warring city-states. Um, Socrates' city was really only as big as the city could support. So you had the city itself, plus you had the farms around it. And that's all they could patrol. That's all they could govern. Um, occasionally, Athens and Sparta would war. And one would take over the other, or one would take over Thebes. But there was never a real um, time in history where two or three cities are really that unified because it would always break apart. And in an oral tradition, the governance can only exist at a, a certain width and depth and scope because you have to rely on oral messages to be passed around, laws to be transferred, um, government to be instituted, and it has to happen in this kind of oral sphere, which means that the Greek city-states were just not that big. Uh, we remember them fondly in history classes, but when you start looking at the map comparatively, it's just not that much land mass. It's not that many people. It would pale in the comparison to, you know, a Charlotte in modern day. Um, comparison. But what we see in Alexander is that he can take over the world. And for the most part, he is doing um, the conquering of the world because of writing, right? So it's kind of a shift, looking at the history of writing and why does the Greek alphabet and why does the Greek system of writing spread to the world? Well, probably because a conqueror took it and spread it, and partly because he understood that writing had power. Okay, so much of what Alexander does is just sort of the business of the day. It's how you conquered people. You would roll into town, kill the men, enslave the boys and the women, uh, rape them at random, burn down the fields, pull together the survivors and tell them you're now in charge. They could either accept that or the cycle repeated itself. Very often standing in this um, carnage, they just took you to be the boss. Um, and that's all well and good. That's how warlords worked. That's how uh, armies conquered up through Alexander. That's how it worked. The problem with that was once you left as the conquering army and you went somewhere else, um, eventually life would just kind of go back to normal. They'd realize you were not coming back, um, that you were not really going to take an interest in this area, and they'd revert back to their older ways and the laws and traditions and you know, kingdoms that had nothing to do with you. They just sort of slide back. What Alexander could do was he could leave a general behind. Um, all of Alexander's generals were literate. All of Alexander's generals knew how to read and write. Um, and so this is where we get this kind of concept that writing defeats time and place because it didn't matter where um, Alexander was, he could always be called back. You know, you couldn't conceptualize the fact that he was so far away from you that he would never come back again because you had met him and travel just didn't work like that for the most part. No one had traveled from northern Egypt all the way to China and then tried to go back again in a lifetime on horseback while conquering. Um, so the idea that he was always within reach, that a messenger could always call Alexander back. And so it meant that you had to listen to the generals. Um, and the generals had to owe allegiance to Alexander and had to be able to kind of uphold Alexandrian law because if Alexander ever came up to back to check or sent another messenger to check or another general to check and you weren't on the script, life was not good. You know, he'd 
burned and pillaged his way through the town the first time, just doing business as usual, nothing personal. Um, this is not a man you want to make mad because you're not following directions and have him come back and scold you militarily. So he uses writing as a tool to build the empire. Um, Alexander's empire is truly impressive. It does you know, conquer the, the known world, as we'd like to say, because the Western tradition sort of ignores most of the African continent and all of Asia. Um, so the Western tradition often talks about Alexander conquering the world, which he does. You can check some maps. It's impressive. He gets to the edge of the Chinese empire, um, which was nearly as large at that, at that point in history, and stops. Um, probably because he realized he could not cross into China and defeat China because they had a military powerhouse he could not even understand in its might and scope. Also using writing, but in a different way than the Greeks were, not in the you know, vowel sounds and consonant sounds, but still using writing as a weapon to make a very large empire. But, you know, maybe just Alexander's happy that he had a big enough empire. Um, famously tries to ride back across it on his horse and dies somewhere in the middle of the empire, in kind of mid-empire. Um, the legacy of Alexander is a several empires kind of grow up out of that. Um, one of the, the problems with handpicking generals to govern every area is they all think they were hand-selected by Alexander to be the next emperor and to take over all of it when he dies. They start warring amongst themselves. They start carving out their own empires. Um, each of the empires that come out of the Alexandrian Empire is bigger in the Western tradition than any empire before Alexander, as long as you don't count Alexander or China or the Egyptian Empire um, going down into you know mid African continent. Um, but if you kind of ignore the parts of the world the Western tradition tries to ignore commonly, Alexander's empire uh, was impressive. Each empire that grows out of it, the Romans, the, the Ottomans, the Turkish, all those other empires that grow out of there also are fairly large and impressive, all of which know that writing is a key to success to governing large areas and large amounts of time. And so writing becomes a weapon within four generations between Socrates, when writing was perfected, to Alexander, we're looking at writing having a power that the world um, has to understand, okay? So looking at the kind of history of writing and why do we write and how do we write, um, you need to kind of understand where the power is in that. Throughout the semester, I'll talk about the social power of writing, that writing you know, is fake and arbitrary. It only actually works because, you know, the reader accepts that this is what this meaning is and the writer writes with that intention to manipulate the reader into you know, action. Um, it's a, a fake interaction. There's a social power there, but that power becomes a real power through acceptance and becomes a tool that can then go into the rest of the world. Pulling back into this with part one of this discussion as you know, Socrates was illiterate. Part two of this was Alexander conquers the world. Um, part three of this discussion really moves into how do we get from Aristotle, Alexander, get from ancient Greeks into the British tradition, you know, Chaucer, um, those kind of time frames. This is not a history class, so I won't draw out a long timeline and show exactly where we're moving, but I will point out that the different empires that follow Alexander moving through Greece, up through Central Europe, modern day Turkey, all the way through um, Germany, and then kind of as you picture, you know, the, the Netherlands and, um, Kind of those, those Roman Empire pieces. All of that's being conquered by the Roman Empire after Alexander and using reading and writing to hold large militaries and large governances together. The Roman Empire, of course, gets so big it can't feed itself, falls apart in fighting, um, political problems, history classes and political classes can you know sort that out for you. But as they recede, they leave Northern Europe and you know, these kind of wild, savage tribal brutes of Europe. So they had been kind of united under the Roman Empire. Um, they keep the, the, the status of the Roman Empire. They keep the roads. They keep the law, the governance, and the writing. Um, and the neat thing about writing down the sounds is that you can then translate other languages, how they sounded, and read them back. And so you kind of have this, this translation piece and other writing systems, you know, grow out of that. The need to write, the need to govern, um, remain with the people. And so when we get to the British Empire, the early days of the British Empire, 
Um, the, the Catholic Church, the Roman Church has um, a large influence on the crowns and the monarchies of Central Europe. Again, this is a, a Cliff Notes version, I'm sure. Um, and one of the things that the church can offer to the monarchy is the ability to read and write Latin, um, primarily, but any language. They could read and write, they could transcribe, they could hold down laws. So there's this um, real symbiotic, well, symbiotic relationship between the church and the crown. And part three of this is that kind of church and crown. Aristotle to Char Chaucer happens really quickly and kind of the conflict between the church and the crown. It's important to think about um, kind of the relationship between the church and the crown. And it's, yeah, the church being the Roman church and then the crown at this point being the monarchies of Europe in general, um, but especially England becomes more and more uh, prominent. And so when we get into this kind of conversation of the church and the crown, there's a symbiotic relationship and uh, the fact that the monarchs sometimes cannot read and write, but they need advisors and people around them that can, and they often turn to the church as literate people to provide those roles. There's also a tension here between the church and the crown. Um, so we're talking about the church and the crown. There's that symbiotic relationship. There's also a division here um, because both the monarchy governing a land and the church governing that same land, um, they're both collecting taxes. You know, your taxes and your tithes both had to be paid. You could be arrested either by the government or by the church for failing to pay either one of those. If you didn't tithe the church as you were obligated to, um, you could be arrested by the church. If you're not a, um, giving your penance and your taxes to the crown, you could be arrested and thrown in prison by the, the, the monarchy and by the government, the local uh, governments. And so they've got this kind of tension where the crown is pretty well, the monarchy of, of Europe are pretty well sure they control the land and the people and the money. And the church is also pretty sure it controls the land, the people, and the money. Um, and eventually it gets to where they're fighting over the body of the people and the souls of the people. And in that conflict, the church could see a civil war was inevitable. And it does it breaks out different times, different countries. The civil war between the crown and the church um, breaks out throughout countries. So one of the things that the church did in anticipation was it created Sunday school. You, know, you were obligated under Roman Catholicism in, in Northern Europe, you were obligated to go to church for half a day, once a week, it was your only time off. Um, for most people was that church time. They would hear the sermons, they would eat together, they'd spend time together, they would recite hymns together. Uh, they would you know, take communion, have masses as we know them primarily. One of the things they also created was this concept of Sunday school. And the initial idea of Sunday school was to teach the masses to read and write. And so people would go to Sunday school to learn to read and write. It was a power that the church was trying to give the populace so that when the inevitable civil war kicked off, they could have the body of the population um, siding with the church and against the crown, as it were. And so they were given this powerful tool trying to win them and convert them in a very militaristic kind of way. If you look through the history of the, the church at the time. Um, so the Sunday school initially is to teach people to read and write. They would put a Latin Bible in front of people, didn't matter what part of Europe you're in, they put a Latin Bible in front of people, and then you would copy the Latin Bible over and over. You eventually learn Latin, you learn to read and write, and you'd have turned out many copies of the Bible that could then be disseminated further, um, put out to homes sold cheaper by the church to raise money um, to fund whatever so this power was given by the church and not given by the crown the crown was a restricting power the church is being seen as given power and you had this kind of conflict invariably um, we get up through you know the, the british monarchy the war of the roses and we're kind of moving into a time of chaucer um, Geoffrey Chaucer was this kind of literary figure that maybe we'll talk about and maybe we'll discuss. And one of the things that Chaucer does is he introduces the concept of the vernacular. It is the common language. So kind of pre-Chaucer, the crown of England, the monarchy of England, um, was conducting business in Latin because it's using the church to help it conduct business around Europe. Latin was understood around most of Europe because of the church connections. 
Um, they often wound up with the times when the ruler of England did not know English at all. They were French, they were Scottish, they uh, were formally educated, um, but you often wound up with these situations where the monarch could not speak the language of the common people, which was fine, um, but Chaucer had a reverence for the common people, his kind of political functionary role. He was a toll collector, a tax collector, and he did some things where he actually interacted with people. Um, and he really wanted to write down the power of the common language and capture what we now call the English language, which is the vernacular, everyday, muck-raking language of England, um, of that part of the empire. Um, and he wanted to write it down and make it have its own power. And so where Geoffrey Chaucer enters this equation, um, we're talking about Aristotle to Chaucer, where Arist he enters this equation is that he writes down the vernacular and empowers the English language as a language. Without Geoffrey Chaucer's championing of the English language, then the British colonies in America would still have been doing uh, business in Latin and would have completely changed the landscape of America as colonies and um, you know, the English colonial language that we ship out around the world um, you know, up through the days of Victor Queen Victoria when the empire is expanding. Uh, it's Queen Victoria, famously, when they say the Southerner sets on the English flag, it's because Queen Victoria has conquered around the entire globe and has holdings around the entire globe and helps create a need to have English, vernacular English, um, or some version of English as the language, lingua franca, of the empire. If we did not have Geoffrey Chaucer, this one particular poet and plagiarist, um, essay writer and, and plagiarist, if we did not have him writing things down in the vernacular and translating pieces like uh, Boethius from its original language into English, you know, philosophy, philosophy like that. Uh, if we did not have Chaucer, then the language of the world would probably still be Latin. Um, it's Chaucer that helps really push vernacular. Yes, it's a larger political movement. There's some other things happening, and maybe someone else in this generation would have, maybe Langland or somebody would have been the Chaucer if Chaucer had not done it. Um, but it's largely Chaucer that we talk about. Chaucer that we agree is the kind of the, the impetus and push of that generation. So the kind of the Chaucer becomes the, the figurehead. One of the reasons that Chaucer is taught in British literature and English 12 and, and uh, so commonly is really just because he's that champion of the common vernacular language, not actually because of what he wrote, which are largely plagiarized because he um, styled himself as a, a translator more than an actual writer. Most of his works are also unfinished because among his main talents, finishing the book was not one of them, um, which leaves short fragments that we can teach pretty easily, which is nice. So there's this kind of time period between the church and the crown and kind of the tension in Europe, and then Chaucer rocking that uh, completely with not only do we need to recognize the language of the people, which are learning to read and write, but also it's going to be English and kind of marking that. So as we're kind of looking over the kind of the history of language and how people read and write, you got mushroom, where does this um, language of English come from and why is it so important? Why does it seem like the monolinguistic ruler of America, even though America has no national language? Um, just kind of the, the quick bullet point pieces uh, goes from Socrates being illiterate to Alexander conquering the world to the importance of Chaucer. Um, we can get into some linguistics classes, history classes, philosophy classes that would slow this discussion down and make this hour last 16 weeks or you know, an entire career. And they probably do it more justice. Um, but since the current textbook does very little to mention anything about Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and their kind of historic role, um, I wanted to point that out. Also, if you look for Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle in most Western uh, colleges and classes and, and really through the Western tradition, you'll realize that because the Socratic method was not um, separated by math class, English class, science class, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, this building, that building, uh, because you went to a philosopher to learn anything you wanted, um, you'll actually find Socrates, Plato, Aristotle at the core of your science, your history, your philosophy, your math, your religion, your rhetoric. Um, they wind up being the core people that everything else is built upon. 
Um, so I highly recommend that if you get a chance to take a philosophy class, particularly an ancient philosophy class, uh, that you consider doing so not because you need to know what someone 2000 years ago thought, but it is often very handy to figure out why people are thinking the way they think now because so much of the thought and rhetoric and education system is built on these foundational uh, philosophers. And so it is not particularly outdated. It is fairly timely. Um, it just seems like you're talking about something that died you know, centuries ago, but it didn't because the Western tradition kept it as being important, okay? At some point, we'll come back to Aristotle. Uh, we'll talk about other things that Aristotle does. Aristotle particularly, is important to the history of writing because of his position. Um, I do want to point out before we go is that you should think about literacy and how that impacts things. Um, Socrates was illiterate, which means he could not write down and leave for us what he said. Plato recorded Socrates, kind of swinging back here for a moment, but it is Plato that recorded Socrates. So it is through Plato that we know what Socrates said, his famous speeches, his famous thoughts, his famous philosophies, we know what he said. Or it is through Plato that we know what Plato wanted Socrates to say, or we know the words that Socrates, Plato put in Socrates' mouth. Um, when you cannot write down your own history, then you have to have your history filtered through someone else, and Plato is filtering that history. Uh, both Socrates and Plato famously are killed by the state. Uh, Socrates is stoned to death or killed. Um, Plato writes about the trial in some detail. Even if there are a few um, details we still quibble about 2,000 years later, Plato writes about that trial and writes about the life and death of Socrates. Plato himself is exiled. Uh, which sounds better than being stoned to death, also sounds better than being poisoned by your students, which is another account of what may have happened to Socrates, is that before he was stoned to death, his uh, students poisoned him um, so he could just fall asleep in a discussion one last time, rather than, you know, being hit to the small rocks. Um, Plato was excommunicated by the government there, he was thrown out and exiled, uh, which sounds better than being hit with little rocks until you die, but Exile meant that no one could shelter him, no one could feed him, and he basically could starve to death in a ditch somewhere and let the dogs pick at his bones, which I'm not sure is better. Uh, by the time Aristotle rolls around, Aristotle is chiefly concerned with not only what did these two founding fathers, Socrates and Plato, have to say and how right they were, but also how do we say it better and not piss off the state and not get executed um, in kind of a very pragmatic way. And so one of the things that Aristotle is chiefly concerned about is not only um, how does philosophy work, but also how does preservation work. And because of that, he gets really into how does writing work. And he wants to really understand all communication, um, but in understanding all communication, he winds up trying to figure out how writing works. And can he do something different in writing that his um, predecessors had not been able to do in the oral society is there something he can do to safeguard his life and to live to be an old man? Old man meaning you know, 30 and catching the common cold, or never dead one day, I'm sure. But you know, relatively old to the generation, relatively healthy until you know, pneumonia takes you out or syphilis or whatever kills you. In the, this, this time frame is a, a tough time to live. So Aristotle will come back particularly. Socrates, Plato, Alexander, Chaucer, those are thoughts to connect to another class another day to be cross-curricular to kind of see how your education fits together. But Aristotle will hang like a specter over this class. I will constantly go back to Aristotle. It is the Aristotelian writing process that we um, use in this class um, that is not incidental. You know, that the kind of writing process, we get it from Aristotle. He steals it from Socrates because Aristotle's writing process is Socrates' thinking process. But when you write it down, you can put your name on it. Um, so Aristotle's writing process is a thinking process, is how thoughts are made, is how writing is made. It still works for all communication, generations, languages, cultural differences, and technology differences aside, it still works. So we'll have you know, kind of this Aristotle remains kind of piece to kind of wrap you up and kind of think about why Aristotle will come back through self-preservation and through scholarship. I um, mean, kind of why he remains a, a fixture and a footnote, at least through the class, even if the textbook 
isn't going to mention him every time he should be mentioned. Um, a large portion of your textbook is actually framed after Aristotle's thoughts. They just don't tell you that because when you write something down, you can put your name on it, um, which we'll discuss later in the semester while plagiarism is problematic, even though we celebrate Chaucer and Aristotle for being great plagiarists. Um, even though your textbook is probably a plagiarist in many ways because it's not giving you credits to where their sources came from. Um, and we'll talk about plagiarism and the problem that presents. But for now, I do want to kind of have this understanding of why Socrates, Plato, but especially Aristotle um, becomes important in, in our composition class. So thank you for taking your time um, to get this lecture that doesn't fit into the class. Um, give you time to hear my voice go through things we didn't have time to do in a room together. I appreciate you spending this time. If you have any questions about this, please always let me know and have a good day.